God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Another week on sin? Are you kidding me? Well, I thought last week just went so well. I was like, let's just do one more week on sin. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So, yep, today, believe it or not, we're going to study the same passage that we studied last week. And we're going to keep doing it until everybody that calls SRC, their home church, finally makes it here on a Sunday when we study this passage together. Good? I kid with you. I make funny joke for you. Oh, no, 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 no. This is our last. This is our last week in this particular text, and I'm a little bit bummed out because when we studied the origin of women, it was on Mother's Day, and today's message is for the guys, and it's not Father's Day, which is which is too bad. But this is what I know. There's something in here for everybody. And, th- and this is what I know, that even if you're not a man here today, that even the ladies, your lives are impacted by men. Listen, that is about as deep as this thing is going to get. If you're like, they said this church got into some of the deeper things. They lied. And let me just say this. Sometimes in the church, we're kind of hard on on dudes. Sometimes in the church, I can be kind of hard on dudes. But this is what I know about men. This is what I know about the men here at Seattle Revival Center, okay? I think you guys are awesome. (laughs) I think you, and and, and the guys are like not celebrating because they feel like there's a butt coming. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Like, oh, I know you. You're going you're gonna to build us up, and then you're going to be like, cut, 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 cut. you're going to matrix punch me. Um, no, no, no. I, I think the dudes here at Sierra Vals are, are, are legitimate. You guys are hard workers. You love your families. You love Jesus. You've got big dreams. You've got stuff. you got stuff going on, don't you? Yeah. Remind the person next. Uh, remind them. Uh, uh, babe, i got some stuff going on. Might not look like it right now, but I got, <laughs> I got some stuff going on. I, 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 I love dudes. I love the way the dudes think. We think differently. We don't necessarily think deeply. We think differently. <laughs> like women, they think about things that matter. They think about people. Men, they think about things that don't really matter. Like how can we make that faster? Like, how can we make that burn hotter? Like, how can we do that, but in half as much time? Which is why most of the inventors are dudes. Because while women were, 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 take, were thinking about things that actually mattered, dudes were just thinking about how to make things faster, hotter, right? More efficient. And... Um, yeah, you know, I think that sometimes in the church, dudes get a bad rap. Sometimes we get beat up a little bit. You know, sometimes we get slapped around a little bit. And it, it, you, need to, you need to love Jesus more. You know, you need to love your families more. You need to take care of your wives more. And sometimes guys just hear more, more, more. And we're like, I'm stinking trying. I'm trying the best. At, you know, not that you're 100 years old, but like, I'm stinking. There we go. Oh, okay, well, you get the... Oh, shut up. <laughs> You'll get what you get. So, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, anyways, guys, I'm on your side this morning. And I feel like the Lord is, is speaking to Sierra Bible Center this morning. I, I think he has something for us. Um, believe it or not, out of this text. And um, the question that I want to ask, and I don't know if you've ever asked this question before, but when it comes to Eden, when it comes to uh, the serpent and this big conversation that the serpent has with, um, with, with Eve is where was Adam and what was he doing? Like during this big conversation, we know that there's, there's a big conversation between the serpent and the woman. 
And it proceeds with Adam and Eve sinning together. But what was, where was Adam that whole time? Okay, and what, what was he doing? He's probably fixing the toilet. I don't know. Let, let's take a look. Let's take a look at the text because it actually, it's actually going to tell us. Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And the serpent started speaking to the woman and said, did God actually say that you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Well, she added some things. She was getting a little chatty. <laughs> Good times. All right, verse 4. But then the serpent said to the woman, you won't surely die. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate it. She also gave it to her husband who was with her and he ate. Verse 7. And then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. So they sewed sig, sig, <laughs> no, fig leaves together and they made themselves some loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking through the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But when the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Adam responded and said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid myself. Then God said, who told you that you're naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I command you not to eat? And the man said, well, that woman that you gave me. <laughs> just, he just threw her right under the bus. She, she gave me the fruit of the tree. And so I ate it. So here's the question. Where was Adam? What was he doing during this entire conversation? To find the answer to that, we just read it. It was verse 6. And it's towards the end of the verse. So, so when the woman saw the... We just fast forward. Slow it down. She, she took of the fruit and she ate. And she also gave some to her, uh, to her husband who was with her, and he ate. What does this tell us? This tells us that for the duration of the conversation between the woman and the serpent, Adam was with her the entire time. She did the speaking. So there was Adam. What was he? Where, where was he? He was there. And what was he doing? He was listening. He was just standing there. He was doing, doing nothing. Now, we've been taught a lot of different things in Sunday school, and we've been kind of like having a lot of our Sunday school paradigm for the, for the book of Genesis kind of deconstructed since we've been going through this thing. One of the things that we've been told is that the very first sin, original sin, was when Adam and Eve took the apple from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they ate of it, and they ate of the apple that the talking, walking snake with the crazy eyes just, Got them to eat. Now let me just tell you this. The very first sin was not when the talking, walking, walking snake got them to eat of the apple. It wasn't. No, no, no. No. The very first sin was the silence of Adam. Now... When it comes to Adam's silence, and when it comes to the temptation, I've always wrestled because of my understanding of the books, book of Genesis that how strange is it that Adam let his wife have a conversation with a evil talking snake. I don't know about you, but if I came home from work and I walked into my house and Andrea was talking to a snake, and the snake was just like, yes. Drink the entire bottle. I'd be like, honey, what are you doing? No. And I'd grab the snake and I would choke it out and then I'd cut its head off. And then I would, then I would burn it outside. <laughs> How many of you have ever wrestled with this story? 
how, like everything in the garden was good, right? Everything in the garden was good. Everything that God created was, was good. And yet, here is this creature that's having a conversation with Eve. And how many of you have ever wrestled with, like, why was Eve even having a conversation? And why was Adam just standing there talking to this serpent? How many of you have ever, like, thought about this? Like, this seems kind of weird to you. Well, today we're going to get back to our deep dive of who this serpent was. And in light of the new information that we have from our study, this is going to take on a whole new light. This, this is going to take on a whole new level of gravity. First of all, we know that the serpent is met, mentioned throughout the Bible, including Isaiah and the book of Ezekiel, where we get to learn a lot more about who this serpent was. We've got to get out of our heads that this thing is a talking, walking snake. and We've got to get into our heads that this serpent, that the, the snake-like attribute of this thing is only one part of the three words used to construct what in the English we simply say serpent. A literal translation of this word in the Hebrew, nakash, is the translation of the the shining one, or where we get the name Lucifer. Now, the name Lucifer is used nowhere in your Bibles. You're never going to find the name Lucifer. Lucifer simply means the shining one or the luminescent one. Now, I'm going to show you what this tempter looked like, what this divine being was like. And uh, we'll just go through this fairly quickly. We have studied this before. This is a bit of a review. But in Ezekiel 28, verse 11, it says that this tempter, that he was the signet or serpent of perfection. Perfect is a big word. Perfect means without error, without blemish. We see that this serpent was the signet of perfection. Number two, full of wisdom. Number three, and I get this a lot actually, perfect in beauty. Yeah, come on. Look at this. His abiding place was in Eden and the garden of God. That every precious stone was his covering. So this, this divine being was, was clothed with a grill of bling. So, you know, in, in my past I used to wear a big bling grill that, that filled my mouth and I had all these diamonds in my teeth. Because I was a very famous gangster rapper. Okay, I'm just, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm just having fun. All right. Like, no, literally, the, 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 this entire being is clothed in skin of diamonds and precious stones. It says, and on the day that uh, he was created, these special stones were being prepared by God himself. He was an anointed guardian cherub. Um, he was placed on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire. Look at this. He was blameless in all of his ways. This is what the tempter looked like. This is what Satan, the adversary, looked like. The best of the best, the smartest, the wealthiest, gorgeous, has a sweet house, lives in Eden. When we talk about Eden, don't think of like a garden where everybody's homeless. When we talk about Eden, I want you to see heaven and earth converging, okay? And I want you to see the city of God established on the earth. When it says that this divine being lived in Eden, they're not just sleeping on the grass. This is the abode, the abiding place of Yahweh Elohim and his heavenly council. We've got the best of the best, the smartest, the wealthiest, the most gorgeous. He is the shining one. He is so beautiful. He is so perfect. He is so wise. He is so glorious. And he's choosing to speak to me. 
This is what Eve is thinking. Mighty God, Yahweh Elohim, wow. And here comes, here comes this divine being, perfect, wise, anointed. Can we talk about anointing for a second? The anointing doesn't make you integrous. The anointing doesn't make you Christ-like. The anointing makes you attractive. Patricia King, she had dinner with a very famous prophet. I'm not going to tell you his name. It doesn't matter. Uh, this was after his fall. He, he never really was fully restored. She says that she was at dinner with him, and she says that he was under the anointing, and he was one of the most beautiful men. And as he shared, she said he was just beautiful. And then at a certain point in the conversation, the anointing lifted and she said he was dark and gross. We see here this anointed being. We see this perfect being. We see this wise being. His home is in Eden. It's not unusual for him to be there. It might not even be unusual to have the conversation. So here is this conversation. Here is this being. And here is Adam. And he's there. And he's taking all of this in, okay? And I want you to, 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 to see yourself as Eve. This, this thing is engaging you. It's talking to you. It's giving you the time of day. And then I want you to see yourself as, as a, a dom. And, 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 and I also want to remind you of what Isaiah talks about, this divine cherub, and what was going on in his heart just prior to the fall. What was going on in the serpent's heart just prior to the fall? Envy, jealousy, pride, and lust. And it was all leading to rebellion. In, in fact, this, this shining one said, I will be like the most high. I will be greater than the most high. I will be more glorious. I will ascend God's holy mountain. Everything that Yahweh Elohim thinks that he is, I will be that and more. Because come on, look at me. All this pride, all of this comparison, that, that the, the fall of the shining one, of the Satan, began with comparison and jealousy. And here is this being that is manifesting and radiating comparison and jealousy. And here is Adam standing there in the presence of that thing. No doubt he feels comparison. He feels all of this temptation. They are being wooed by the serpent. They are, they are in this place and they are comparing themselves in the same way that Satan compared himself with Yahweh Elohim. Elohim, the temptation is comparison. The temptation is pride. The temptation is lust. This is what Moses says: the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. It was the same wooing in the, in the luminescent one, Lucifer, and it was at work within Eve as she began to look on these things and as they began to entice her and then there is Adam. Now, here is Adam, and Adam is not um, uh, in this place. He's not a loser, and he's not lazy, and he's not passive. He's not all these things that we try to put on men in the church. Here is Adam, and in this place, how do you think that he feels? He probably feels in this place like he's not as beautiful. He probably in this place feels like he is not as wise. In this place, he probably feels like he is not as perfect. In this place, he probably feels like he's not that supernatural. In this place, he feels feels merely human to the degree that the Satan is saying what you really want is to be like us. And this is what God knows. If you eat of this fruit, you will be like us. 
But little did Adam know that the Satan was tricking them to sacrifice their identity using the temptation that they will be like him. Using the temptation to say, you will be like us, a part of the divine council. But little did Adam know that Satan was jealous of Adam. Satan was jealous that this were, uh, was a being that was created in the image and likeness of God that had the ability to do what God did, and that was to be fruitful and multiply within the context of covenant union they could begin co-creating multiplying that they had the ability themselves to procreate and to fill the earth the adversary wanted to to subvert the identity of God's creation he wanted to take this thing that had gone from chaos Okay, into cosmos and to bring this order, cosmos means order, back into chaos. Thereby fracturing the identity of mankind, but not just fracturing it, but hijacking it. He wanted for his seed to mingle with the seed of mankind, thereby making the earth his dominion and filling the earth with his offspring. It was a war for the DNA. It was a war for the seed. This had very little to do with a walking, talking snake that tried to get them to eat an apple. It had everything to do with a different kind of fruit, the fruit of the womb. And in this place, Adam and Eve, they believe the lie that they are less than. They believe the lie that they are not as beautiful. They believe the lie that they are not as supernatural. They believe the lie that they are not as anointed. They believe all of these lies because of this place of comparison, this place of jealousy. And I'll tell you what came over Adam. I'll tell you what kept him silent. It's the same thing that's trying to come on men in our nation today. It was the spirit of overwhelm. In this place, Adam stands underneath a torrent of information. Standing in this place, literally being shamed by the perfection of this divine being. And there, in that place of shame, jealousy, and comparison, he stood with this paralysis of analysis. I am a loser. I might as well just shut up and let my wife broker a deal with this corrupted divine being. And when they are done brokering the deal, the woman takes of the fruit, eats of it, gives it to her husband. He does not say a word. He has tapped out. He feels less than. He feels like he does not measure up. And he thinks that if he eats of this fruit, he will supernaturally come up into the state and status of a divine being joining the heavenly council of God. Instead, it costs them everything. They think they're going to step into their awakened identity. Instead, it costs them a fractured identity. They think that they are going to be close to God, and instead it robs them of their relationship with God. They think that they're going to step into this place of, of, of great divine intelligence and great, great, great pride. Instead, they're going to step into this place of fracturedness. God promises that from the seed of the woman, which women don't have seed, speaking of that God is actually going to bypass the man and bring forth his own seed into the woman through immaculate conception, supernatural conception, would bypass the seed of the man so that the Christ man can come without any generational curses or any bloodline of the male to be impacted by what God was going to do. In this place, God bypasses the bloodline of the man. Mary conceives and brings forth the Christ. 
in a few weeks, we're going to get into Genesis chapter 6. And because they had opened themselves up to the enemy, they surrendered their portal over to the enemy. And we do see corrupted flush, flesh and the intermingling of serpent seed with the seed of man. This would go for generations. This would go all the way into the famous story of David and Goliath. You know that Goliath wasn't the only giant that David and his mighty men slayed? There were five giants, and all five of them had to be killed. Why? Because this Nephilim seed had to be removed from the earth. This had to be judged. This serpentine seed that had corrupted the flesh of mankind had to be judged, and God would use David and his mighty men. The same line by which Christ Jesus would come, his divine seed through Mary, to bring forth the great Emmanuel, God with us. God became flesh and dwelt among us through the woman. This is not exactly the seeker-sensitive service. This is not the preschool of, 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 of we're, we're into some meat. So if you're a new Christian and you haven't developed your, your teeth yet, that is okay. Just listen, take as much in as you possibly can. It'll start to make sense. The Holy Spirit will start to make sense out of it. But it's, it's important that we, fit, that we are honored as the body of Christ. And that we are honored by receiving the uncensored truth of God's word, even if it's offensive to our Sunday school traditions. Are you okay with that? This is what every man fills. They fill this reality that's nagging them, a voice that's reminding them that they are not good enough, that they're failing everybody, that they're not rich enough, that the world would be better off without you, that you're not anointed enough, that, that you'll never truly be godly, that the lie of the enemy through jealousy and comparison comes to overwhelm you, to convince you that you are not enough. The enemy comes to overwhelm you. Why? Because he wants to silence you. Silence always precedes surrender. In times like these, the enemy is coming to shame men every single day. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not living up enough. Pastor Darren's disappointed. Your family's disappointed. Your wife is disappointed. Your country's disappointed. You are not enough. And the enemy comes to silence men. Because when we go silence, the silence is an indicator that we are about to raise the white flag and surrender. Let me speak to every man in this room. You are not about to surrender. You are not about to give up. You are not about to yield. You are not about to submit to the serpent, to his glory, or to his false promises. The serpent is a liar. And greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And I get it. I get it. I get it. We're we're, we're in this fight. We hear these voices. We feel these emotions. We're trying our hardest. We fail. We do some stupid stuff. Get Busted in some stupid stuff. And now you didn't just do something stupid. Now you are stupid. Now you didn't just fail. Now you're a failure. And how do men handle that? They don't get onto Facebook. Oh, I feel like a failure today. They don't. They don't go to their home group and say, man, I screwed up and I I believe I'm a screw up. No, this is what men do. When men feel like they're a total failure, like they're a total screw-up, they find a place somewhere inside 
where it feels safe, and they hide it. And they hide it, and they hope that nobody else sees what they feel. We hide it, we hide the battle, we try to keep our shoulders back, we try to perform to just enough of a degree that we won't be rejected because no man ever wants to be rejected. And for those that have been, for those dudes that have been rejected by their dads, rejected by their brothers, rejected by the church, rejected by their jobs, at a certain point, a lot of dudes just say, man, screw it, forget it, I'm done. I'm done with the church. I'm done with marriage. I'm done with corporate America. Think of the countless men in Seattle who went silent, who surrendered, and abdicated their role of leadership, and are living out on the streets, not because they lost their minds, and not because they're drug addicts, and not because they, they're veterans that did horrible things overseas. Good guys who have given up everything. Why? Not because they lost their mind, but because they lost their heart. They went silent. They surrendered. It wasn't that nobody was there. It's just that there was just nobody you could really trust. Let me tell you something. Whether you're a man or you're a woman, there's a battle for our heart and there's a battle for our hope. There's this religious temptation to have to pretend, to have to pretend like you have your act together, to have to pretend like you're a good Christian, to have to know the right things to say and all, all of this and all of, all of that. But if you're a woman in this place, if you're a man in this place, and you're feeling the temptation to be silent, I'm going to give you the answer this morning. The answer I get is from King David. There's a story where David was completely overwhelmed. And it's out of Psalm chapter 13. He's overwhelmed. He feels like a coward. Feels like nobody's there. For, feels like he's failed his nation. Feels like he's failed his men. He's ready to die. And I'll tell you what David does in Psalm chapter 13. He screams from the cave. If you're in a cave this morning, it's the perfect place to scream. If you're lost this morning and you just feel like, man, what's the point? You're in the perfect position to make noise. When everything's coming after you and you figure, I'd scream, but what's the point? I'd make noise. I'd ask for help, but what's the point? If you're, if you're in a position like that this morning, all you have to do is make noise. Make noise. The enemy's going to do everything possible to get you to shut up. Just shut up. Nobody cares. Just shut your face. Just shut up. Just like, imagine how Adam felt just standing there. You're a fool. Just shut up. Eat the fruit. The fruit will fix everything. What does David do? David screams out from the cave. I want you to imagine you're standing outside of the cave. I want you to imagine David doesn't think, he doesn't know you're there. And he's screaming like a fool. And what does he scream? How long, oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? This is what David, this is what David says. God, I don't even think that you're listening. It doesn't matter. I'm going to scream at you until you do. I, this is what David says. I know that you have abandoned me. It doesn't matter. I'm going to scream at you until you can't ignore me. From the cave, David thinks he's about to die. He says, have you led me here to die? How long shall my enemies make a mockery out of me? He's here screaming at God, screaming at God, screaming at God. And finally, you know what he says? But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. 
I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. David got into some rough situations and whenever David would get overwhelmed, he'd start screaming. He would start screaming. Skip a beat. There's a man born on the earth in the line of the screaming shepherd. We're introduced to Jesus, the Christ, who becomes our screaming shepherd. We do know that Jesus' life wasn't taken. He gave it freely. And yet he did not give it silently. When they said to Jesus, what's your defense? Defend yourself. He wouldn't offer a defense. But when they put him up on the cross, the screaming shepherd began screaming the same prayers of David. Dad! Dad! From the cave, he started screaming. Why? Because if silence precedes surrender, you need to know the cross, my friend, was not a white flag. The cross was not about surrender. The cross was about victory. That people who are about to surrender and about to defeat it, they go out quietly. But people who are about to deal a blow to the enemy, even if it costs their own life, the victorious always go out loudly. On the cross, Jesus began to scream. All the way up to the final moment, Jesus let everybody know, it is finished. Can we stand to our feet? You might not have a song to sing. You might not have the words to pray. You might not have the answers. You might not feel good enough. You might not feel rich enough. You might feel like a scumbag. You might feel like a dirt bag. You might feel like a cheat. You might feel like a pervert. You might feel like an alcoholic. You might feel like a coward. You might be hiding in your cave like a little baby. Don't do it silently. Find your voice and scream. Find your voice and make noise. Be like the screaming shepherd. Be like David in the cave. Dad, where are you? Where are you? Where? I need you. I need you right now. I need you right now. Because silence is not an option. Surrender is not an option. Declare me right now. Silence is not an option. Surrender is not an option. I will not yield. I will not surrender. I will not eat the fruit. My wife will not eat the fruit. My children will not eat the fruit. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Let's make noise, make noise, make happy noise, make noise.
need you. I need you. I need you. I need you. Can I have our prayer ministry team come real quick? If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor Darren, I've been silent because I've been about to surrender. But I need to make noise. I need to make noise. I need to make noise because I'm in trouble this one. Pastor Darren, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. My family's in trouble. I'm in trouble. My heart is in trouble. Standing at the front of the room are really good mothers and fathers who I trust. Please don't be religious. Please don't try to be perfect in and of yourself. Please be honest with yourself and make noise this morning. Make noise this morning. Don't shut up. Don't shut up, don't shut up, don't yield, don't surrender, don't cower. You're not in this alone. You're not in this alone. We are in this together. Amen? Amen? Amen?